So we always talk about problems and we talk about problems, we talk about problems. However, today we have a solution. We have, to ha we have a handle on colony collapse disorder, which has really annihilated our bees. And we've turned around the annual high death rate of bees. The question now remains, will we allow it to happen? Unfortunately, over the last 20 odd years, we, here in the US, we have not, we've been trying to fight it. I'll also talk about how to attract native bees and manage bees to your environment. What is the impact of climate change? And then my favorite topic, how are Africanized bees affecting our environment? So it's all about education. If you want people to know that each species has its own story, coloring, and especially evolved body parts along with the surprising soapoperatic element to the details of solitary bees. All this work can be wiped out in an instant if we just allow a bulldozer or a bottle weed killer to come onto the property. So in the US, we have over 4,000 different bee species, of which 1,000 plus different species are here in Texas. And I say plus because the last four years, we've been focusing on trying to document the native bees here. Six years ago, we said there were 400 in the US, so 1,000 at the moment and still climbing. Down to small bees, which is in the top right-hand corner, honey bees on the left-hand side on the same flower, just to give you an idea of what size they are. So a bit of facts about bees. They range between two and 14 millimeters. And I assume since you guys are down in clear water, you're all metricated. They're hairy, they have more hair on their bodies than we do. They suck up liquids through a capillary action on their tongue, which is very ticklish. They have mandibles that chew on the pollen as well as the wax. The vision, they have two compound eyes that look at shape, movement, and color. And then they have three simple eyes on the top of the head that locate their position as well as the time of day. And the ability of them to do that has been incorporated into a lot of the new uh, cameras in the iPhones. As you guys will probably read, the color of the sun in the morning when it gets up is different to noon and is different to the afternoon. They use that determined time of the day. The body attracts pollen two ways, either through static electricity or they use the liquid from their saliva to create a ball and put it on their back legs. Some bees also buzz pollinate flowers. We'll talk a bit more about it later on. But since your interest is very much in native bees, I've included where they live. So in hollow stems and plants, we have small carpenter bees, large carpenter bees, rain bees, yellow face bees, etc. Holes in wood, there's six of them that are in the holes in wood, and this is not initially all of them. However, 70% of our native bees live in the ground. The mining bees, hence, because they dig in the ground, cellophane bees, squash bees, etc. And I'll talk about some of these later on. One of the interesting things about bees is they don't see the same spectrum as we do. And on the bottom of the slide, you'll see our spectrum at the top and the bees at the bottom. They don't see red, but they do see ultraviolet and blue. And if you use a black light on a plant or a flower, you'll notice that color is very different to what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And just in passing, I've been doing that on birds. So in birds, we always know that the male is the most colorful and the female is, is gray. Try shining some black light on a gray female and see what color it's got. It's fascinating. So there's some pictures of the compound eye on the left and then the flowers, the way we see them on the left and the way the bees see them on the right. So are the bees really disappearing? And the answer to that is, yes, it is, but it depends on who you speak to, to what you're going to get. So here in the US, we lose about 60 to 80% of our colonies, kept managed by colonies every year. We don't hear a lot about that apart from when they want money from the government because the beekeepers can artificially breed to replace them. And we do that every year. Our bumblebees, 28% of them at risk. Here in Texas, we have six bumblebees on the dangerous list. Stingless bees, which the Indians talk about, the Mayans talk about, have finally left the US in about 2014, I think was the last colony they found. Native bees, we just don't know because we haven't been tracking them or even know how many native bees there are. There's a bit of land up in the north where they've been monitoring for the last hundred odd years, the different species in that land and that property. And they've been doing this constantly. So back in the 1970s, they found 142 different species of, of bees on that property. In 2000, they found 53. In 2007, they only found 14. So the question is, are the bees disappearing? 
colony collapse disorder. There was a term that was conjured up in the 1970s to start explaining the high death rate of bees here in the US. And a lady called uh, Dee Lusby was contracted by the Department of Agriculture to research this. And she ended up interviewing over 100 beekeepers, of which she has videos of all those different interviews. Basically, it boils down to a couple things. First of all, poisons. Bees are insects. And when you use an insecticide and a bee lands on it, it will kill it. We talk about, oh, there's a lethal dosage of 50%. You're not allowed to use more than that. But somebody never told the pharmaceutical company that bees actually visit more than one flower at a time. So within a particular trip, they can visit 200 to 500 flowers. They've picked up well above the toxicity levels they need to die. Fungicides are also dangerous to bees. Bees use funguses in their hives to create different foods. And so what that does is kills the fungus in the hive. The bees then starve. Nutrition is another factor causing colonies collapse. Uh, we've moved away from the various different types of plants to monocropping, huge fields of monocropping where the bees cannot fly further than that particular crop. They, like us, need a variety of food. And if they don't get that, become weak and susceptible to not only disease, but also our, um, parasites. GMOs have been created to address the issues of being visited by insects and other predators. Um, what they've done in a lot of these GMOs is they've got rid of the nectar, which the bees uh, depend on, and hence no longer provides food for them. Chemicals such as miticides and antibiotics have been applied to hives to try and protect the bees. Unfortunately, the mites and the um, diseases they pick up, the viruses, take about four years to get around that particular chemicide, but the chemicide still has an impact on the life of the bee. Then we try to upsize bees. Typically in farming, we say the bigger is better. And so we try and make the creatures larger to produce more for us. And the bee size was upsized from a natural environment for here in Texas, which is around about a 4.7 millimeter body diameter to 5.3. Unfortunately, that impacted the thermodynamic equilibrium and bees are battling with the climate. It also affected the body. So the body didn't change in any way, it just got larger. So now there are gaps between the plates on the abdomen perfect soft material for the mites to bite in. They also can't fly as far as they used to be able to. So a feral bee can fly, fly for around about 10 miles. I manage bees for less than a mile, which means that the variety of food they have available is a lot less. There's been various management systems put in place, but one that was developed by uh, D. Lusby was called small cell. In other words, go back to the original bee size. So looking around the world, which bees or bee species around the world is not impacted by things like mites and the various uh, diseases we have in this country. And we find that the Asian bee is a typical example that has survived. So is the African bee and they're all small. So we've created a small cell management philosophy to try and get back to what's normal. How well do we do? So here's a little tally sheet that was created to determine that as a gardener, how well are you doing to provide food and environment for uh, not only the pollinators, but other insects in your garden. And it's an interesting one to be able to fill out. Our native bees, which is where I'm gonna try and focus on, are really important for us because they are very specific to the plants they pollinate. You kill off that plant, we stop planting that plant, and that species of bee dies out. You kill that species of bee, and that plant dies out. So there's this relationship between them. For many of them, you'll find that the bee start, uh, comes out of the ground, pupates just before that particular plant flowers. What's actually triggering this, we're not sure. We think it could be soil temperature or moisture or even light, but nobody's come up with a concrete reason of what's this happening. So there is this impact that if we kill one, we'll lose the other. Uh, here's an example of what happened in New Braunfels. People complained to the municipality they were having too many mosquitoes in the area. The municipality's answer was, well, let's fog. They sent a fogging machine down the road. They fogged the area. And within a couple of hours, we saw the road littered with dead bees. They had not only killed the mosquitoes, but they killed the bees as well in that area. So we've got to be careful of how we approach things. Rather try and use the natural enemy for that particular creature you want to get rid of. And if you look at the integrated pest management philosophy, never get rid of them 100% because something worse always takes their place. The idea is to get rid of them below and the level of which they become a, a pest. When you're dealing with gardens, uh, the thing is to use natural weed killers rather than uh, chemicals. And there are several that one can use. One of the popular ones is steam. 
or otherwise look for the natural enemy for that particular problem that you might have. So let's look at the bees specifically. We have two types of, basically two types of bees, the social bee and the solitary bee. The social bee, some of our native bees are social bees, for example, the bumblebees. They will create a nest underground. And then the, as the numbers increase in the spring, they will collectively lay eggs in that area and collectively look after them. Then when it comes to fall, the queen then lays a few eggs for over the winter. They hibernate during winter and they come back in spring. Our honeybee has, um, the, actually, our honeybee never hibernates, unlike our native bees. Almost all, all our native bees will hibernate. And that's why the honeybee has a surplus of honey, is to try, try and provide food throughout winter. Uh, they will be constantly laying throughout the year to replace those bees that are dying off. A solitary bee, however, the queen lays the egg. She First of all, she um, emerges in spring just before the flower that she's after comes into bloom. She then lays her egg. She could use a common entrance into the ground or into the stem, uh, which she will then have her own compartments on the side. And she'll lay between five and six eggs before she dies. Those eggs will then hatch. Your larva will then develop into a pupa. The pupa will, will develop until just before the bee stage and stay then that stage until spring and then emerge out of it. So what I say to you, please respect the native, particularly the solitary bee. While our European honeybee colonies have thousands of workers to bees to collect the pollen for the brood, a solitary bee female has to build her nest and bring home food all by herself. So if you destroy that female through whatever method, squashing, flapping, uh, pesticides, etc., there's a, lot, a whole lot of babies that will not be born and the, that particular species will eventually die out. Our native or ground besting knees can be compared to seeds because of the way they emerge from the earth in spring. They dig themselves out during a brief and variable period when their preferred plants are becoming bloom and presumably get some sort of temperature environmental trigger that causes this. For example, if it has been a dry winter, those plants are still dormant, the bees will stay underground until the conditions are right. So we don't necessarily see all the native bees at the same, in the same year. They could skip a year if necessary. The only point I want to bring out of this particular slide is that the um, different native bees will come out at different temperatures. So we have the mason bee, which comes out at about 55 degrees. We have the leaf cutter bee, which comes out when temperatures get above 75 degrees. A European honey bee only starts to think about around 55 degrees. And the reason for that is they cannot generate enough heat to sustain the temperature for flight. Their wings fly, flap at about 200 times a second, and they need a lot of muscle to be able to do that. And it gets too cold, they can't do anything. So different temperatures will create, will bring out different bees. Some of the bees we have here in uh, Texas, we have the mining bee and they make their nests in the ground. We have the squash bee, which focuses on the squash plants. And they have developed because bees generally don't get up too early in the morning. They tend to sleep in a little bit, but our squash plants tend to bloom at sunrise. So they would miss the pollination of it. So the squash bee has developed the ability to wake up just before the sun and in time to be able to, uh, to pollinate the flowers. Um, we have others like the leaf cutter bee. The leaf cutter bee actually uh, cuts semicircular holes in your, in your leaves right on the edge. They fold up that leaf, they take it in, and they use that to make a cocoon for their offspring. So what do our native bees need? They need two basic things. They need food. And the food comes in the form of nectar. Nectar is the carbohydrate that gives them the energy. Uh, also coming with that nectar are a whole lot of minerals and vitamins that they need. They also need pollen. Uh, pollen is their um, protein source. And some bees will not take protein that's under 23% protein. There are a few bees that are really on the borderline version of that. And then they need a suitable place to nest and to lay the eggs. Let's go back to the nectar side. So nectar is basically a uh, sugar-based liquid that has that's based in water. But in West Texas, we don't have much water, and neither do the plants. So the plants have developed oils, which keep the sugar in there. And so bees, some bees have actually uh, modified themselves to be able to deal with water. 
Now, I mentioned earlier on that their tongue is basically a capillary tube with lots of feathers on it so that the liquid goes up the tube with the capillary action. But being oil-based, that is less, uh, less possible. So they have to, their tongue has modified slightly to be able to lick up oil and take oil in. Principal driving factor for the native bee decline is the widespread of habitation to destruction. And especially in our flower-rich or grasslands, savannas and woodlands, we have turned them into either just grasslands or we've turned them into um, food. So what do we need for bees? We need you to allocate a, an area for them to live in. These, this area will be basically just a um, old dried up leaves, soil, needs to be some sort of dampness, but that needs to be untilled and kept damp like that for the whole of the year. Because if you try and till it up during winter or rake up the leaves, you're destroying the nest that are in there. So keep in whatever area you put in your garden or your um, local park, have an area that is fenced off for native bees. It doesn't have to be very big, probably about three to four square yards. They, you will find that over time period, there will be a lot of little holes in there. Don't walk on it, don't rake it, don't till it. Leave loose bark, dr dried up wood, hollow stem uh, plants. And that brings another aspect is during uh, winter, we tend to cut back a lot of our reed type plants. If you're going to cut them back, leave about two feet of the, of the stem in there because that's where the native bees are going to be sleeping for winter. So here's a picture of a bee in the ground. The surface has been scraped away so you can see it. It'll lie there until spring. There's another one popping up. That's actually a, a um, sweat bee coming out. So a nice little cartoon, but the important aspect is we need to make sure that there's food for bees. And our manicured your lawns and vegetation is not the place to go. So many gardens I go and look at them are referred to as green deserts because under that grass that's kept alive through pesticides and artificial fertilizers, all the bugs, the bacteria, the worms are dead. There's nothing in there for the bee to eat. There's a grass area that I think is great. It's got a lot of little flowers in it. You will find a lot of bees that will find, in fact, there's a bee called a tickish bee, a tickle bee that lives in the grass like that. And it's a fun bee, it doesn't sting, but majority of them have disappeared off our land. Various uh, seed producers, and I will mention, I think there's two that I remember. There's one from uh, the University of Ohio, and then our local one, the uh, native plant seed, have, actually have a seed pack specifically for lawns for bees. And these are all native plants, native grasses that are in there, so they don't require a lot of upkeep or water. So how do we attract them? Use plants. Diversity of plants because bees need diversity of food. There should be blossoms from spring right through until fall. Keep these plants pesticide free, including fungicides. And bear in mind that systemic insecticides kill bees as well because the plant soaks it up and it gets into their pollen as well as their nectar. Provide the homes, dried leaves on the ground, keep bare patches, both disturbed and undisturbed ground and then keep uh, non-aggressive bees in the area. There is a talk that the managed honeybee that we have reduces the population of our native bees. Uh, I've seen research done that shows, yes, they do. I've seen research that says, no, they don't. So really, I'm not sure at this stage with it, what it is. My experience has been that as I put hives in nature areas, we tend to see more and more of uh, the native bees in that area, whether it's because we are more observant or what it is, I'm not terribly sure at this stage. Leave stems eight to 12 inches when you cut back perennials. Leave old logs, or particularly weak uh, softwood logs in your garden so they can burrow into them. They also like piles of dried grass or sticks, particularly our bumblebees. Take local climate into account. Now we're sitting with uh, climate change, I mean, it's getting hotter, some areas are getting wetter, some areas are getting drier. How can we influence this? Well, client affects habitat loss. So if you keep a dry area, at least an area that is just uh, dirt, make sure it's slightly damp to help them. Extreme weather events are a problem and it also shifts the range. So we can have an area that's moist. Think of the local climates. Bees are very effective to the microclimate the area it is. So we can put a few trees to keep the temperature down. We can put a sprinkler or uh, some other way of moisturing in that area to keep it moist for the bees. 
they definitely need water. They need water for not only keeping their burrows or their hives cool, but they also need water to consume the honey that they produce. Collect data. You know, there are a lot of citizen science projects out there that you can collect some data, enter it into the computer, and that contributes to research that's been done all over the US as well as elsewhere on what's happening to our bees. For example, there's the Monarch Larva Monitor Project, there's the Bumblebee Watch Project, there's iNaturalist. Uh, have a lot of different projects there. There are a couple of them that I'm participating in, which are about uh, native bees. Here's a picture of bees. The top left-hand corner, there's some holes in a, some mud where the bees have uh, made homes. The bottom left-hand corner is a hole in a piece of wood where the bee has made its cocoons in there. So you'll see there is one, two, three, four, five cocoons plus a sixth one. And I break them up because the first five they put in the deeps, the hole will be the female bees and the one at the entrance will be the male bee. One is he can be sacrificed if necessary, unfortunately. But the other reason also is that he should be the first one to emerge. And then what he will do is become sexually mature. So when the females start hatching, he's ready to mate with them. On the right hand side, the big picture is that of a bumblebee nest, those round egg shaped cocoons. And that's typically a couple of inches to about a foot underground, but they prefer soft soil or otherwise just grass patches. And on the surface, the first uh, on the left hand side picture in the middle of there, that is what it looks like on the surface. And you dig down to that, you will find the bumblebees. So types of sociality, we get the solitary bee female that builds and provisions a cavity in the ground, places an egg. With that egg, she'll put a ball of pollen, and in that ball of pollen, she'll make a small indent where she puts some nectar for the bee. Communal bees, these are females that share the same nest, but do not take care of each other's brood. Then you get the social bees. We divide that into subsocial bees. This is where there's no division of labor. One female lays the egg and provides for that larva but they jointly have uh, the same nest. Then you get the eurosocial bees, which are predominantly the bumblebees and honeybees. Here labor is shared amongst the other bees based on the age of the bee. So when the bee comes out for the first time, the first two or three days, that bee's sole job, female-wise, the male doesn't do anything. Uh, the female has to clean. And then as she gets older, she becomes more, has better control over her body and her muscles. Then she starts feeding. Then she starts repairing the hive. And then she goes out and forages. So I mentioned there the male doesn't. No, the male doesn't do very much in the hive. It doesn't clean, doesn't fix, doesn't forage. And the females feed the male. So what is the job of the male? Well, we find males often above the pupa, so we believe there might be something that he does. They're either keeping them warm because of his size, he can generate a lot of heat. But biologically wise, he only has a single strand of DNA, whereas all the other bees have the double strand. And as a result of his having a single strand of, of DNA, he has the ability to turn on and turn off genes based on stresses of the local environment. And so we believe that one of the roles that he potentially has is to ensure that the bee genetics can adapt to what's ever happening in the local environment. Here's a picture of an underground nest, a single entrance shared by multiple bees, and then each queen will have a branch of her own. And the insert picture, you'll see a ball of pollen there. Uh, in that dent will be some nectar. On top of that is the larva that's just hatched from the egg. There is a um, metallic green bee coming out. That's to be a sweat bee. Uh, from the ground. Some of the bees will actually build tunnels or chimneys above their nest to protect it from any moisture or rain. So we mentioned early on phenology, which is the symbiotic relationship between plants and uh, pollinators. So native bees generally hatch just before the target bee blooms. Some plants only have one species that pollinate it, and some bees will only pollinate one plant. What triggers the bee to hatch is unknown. It's suggested along the lines of soil temperature, moisture, daylight, but we're not terribly sure. But as the climate changes, so does the range for the plants, as well as the time of blooming of that plant change. But we have seen a gap develop between that of the native insect as the pollinator from the plant. How big this gap is going to be, we're going to get, we're not terribly sure. And will they be able to adapt to other species of plants is still out for debate. But we are concerned at the present stage of whether this will actually help or not. Africanized bees. Oh, one of my favorite topics. 
So Africanized bees, and my comment is really, well, people say there were no bees in the US. And the reason for that is because if it's a native, you can't poison it. So the pharmaceutical company said, well, then there are no, no bees. What they actually meant, there were no European honeybees in America. There are 4,000 other bee species, and both the Indians and Mayas have freezers in their temples showing bee collection and honeys. So in about 1956, one of the species in Africa was brought to Brazil and Louisiana, which we don't hear too much about, uh, to cross with the European honeybee to create a more efficient bee for a monocropping environment. The African bee is really efficient, and the European bee is very gentle, but not that efficient. What happened is some of the bees escaped, and they thought this was a wonderful opportunity to see what the impact was going to be, so they started collecting data. One of the data they collected was deaths that could assumably be related to bee stings, because they found animals and creatures dead with lots and lots of bee stings in it. What they don't tell you is they never collect this data before the release, so we don't know how many people, creatures, were killed before them by the natural bees in that environment. Hollywood picked up on this and they said, oh, fear cells, so let's create a lot of uh, hoopla around these bees that are escaping, and they called them killer bees, and ever since then people have been petrified them. Uh, two of the states in the US, Florida and uh, California, both have uh, rules, laws that if you have Africanization in your hive, you've got to burn them. Uh, Texas uh, took a different approach. Our state, APRIS, said all bees in Texas have African genetics in them. From a beekeeper's perspective, we want these feral bees, these Africanized feral bees. Over time, the genetics have been diluted. They're not as nearly as aggressive as they used to be, but I'll talk about aggression later on. They're very efficient. They are very resistant to diseases and mites and other pests like that, to the extent that I have not treated my hives at all, and I don't have the death rate. I have about a 1% death rate, and most of the time, that's because of carelessness of myself. The commercial beekeepers don't particularly like them because these Africanized local uh, bees do not tolerate what I call rough, lazy beekeepers. Mess around them too much and they just leave. Food shortage and they abscond. So it takes a different way of treating and looking after them. All bees can potentially become aggressive. Well, it's not really aggression because bees are defenders, but they can be triggered to protect their hives. And a lot of that is addressed by things like weather. The advantage of these bees is they live longer. Uh, we don't waste money on treatments that are not always necessary. They fly a lot further so they can forage for greater distances and hence can actually live in marginal areas. They have a higher density on frames, which is important for keeping away pests in the hives like the hive beetle, uh, ants, moths, things of that nature. They also the higher density means the higher heat in there. And as a result of that, they can kill off different uh, viruses and uh, bacteria that can't take high heat. They are very productive. You don't have to artificially requeen them, which is a big advantage for the genetics, because what's happening with the commercial queens is they're coming from a very limited genetic pool. And hence, all our bees are beginning to have the same genetics or our managed bees, which is a problem. Whereas our native bees are openly requeen themselves and mate, as a result is they have much better genetics. On the negative side of the small cell or our native feral bee is they do not tolerate rough beekeepers. I mentioned that. They're not afraid to leave the hive. They're not afraid to defend the hive. And they do remember for a long time. In fact, from my experience, they remember across gen cross generations. How they do it, not an idea, but they do. So the temperament of the bees affected by genetics, um, by weather, uh, how they've been treated, food reserves, where they've got brood or where they don't have brood. Bees communicate through smell and vibration. So if you flood the area with a strong perfume or deodorant, that confuses them where it comes from. They panic because they can't communicate and they attack anything big that's not normally there. They also communicate through vibration. And so you come across past a hive with a vehicle that's vibrating, like um, SUVs, like uh, golf carts, diesel-driven tractors, etc. They can't work out where it's coming from. It's abnormal. They panic, and so they come out to defend themselves. So a European honeybee will send out about 10 bees to go and sort out the problem. The Africanized bee, much more efficient. They will come out, and they will, they will send about 100 to come sort you out. Is that a problem? Well... 
since you need 100 bees per pound of body weight to become lethal, it's not really a problem because you're not going to get that number of stings. But where it is a problem is that people panic. And when you panic, you generate a lot of hormones in your body. It affects your organs and you get an organ shut down, which is where most of the people die from it. So why do bees get irritated? Well, let's look at the weather aspect to it. We often get fronts that have rapid pressure changes coming through. So the picture on the right-hand side is the air tubes inside a bee. So the bee doesn't have vessels that take blood all over. The whole body is one vessel. They have vessels that take air and sacs, air sacs within that body. So feeding these air sacs, the, the tubes have very small holes on the outside called trachea down the abdomen, they are tiny. And when you get high pressure changes or fast rapid pressure changes, it takes some time for the pressure inside the body to equalize with that outside. So just imagine if we have a sudden drop of pressure, the bees feel very bloated and it makes them irritable. You have a, high, a sudden increase in pressure, they feel compressed. And just like if you're in bed and your blankets get tied around you, you panic, they do the same thing. So the one thing about dealing with these local feral bee or Africanized bee, Take into consideration what's happening with the weather and realize that they're reacting to that. And if it is a high pressure change or rapid pressure change, come back another day. Where do bees eat? What attracts them for their food? Well, color attracts them, but red flowers not to any great extent. But that red flower, put a black light on it and see whether it is really red. They do love blue flowers, at least blue to our eyes. The scent of the flower is important to them. Uh, whether the flower has nectar and pollen, or is it just uh, nectar or just pollen? The electrostatic charge on a flower also tells them. So when a bee flies, it picks up electricity, static electricity from the air passing through its wings, passing over the hairs on the body. It visits the flower, it leaves that static electricity on the flower. So when the next bee comes along, it senses that and says, right, this flower has really been visited, misses that flower and goes on to the next one. So you probably all know this, um, but if you look at the flower, you have the male, the anthers at the top, which has the pollen. You have the female stigma in the middle, which is what needs to accept the pollen. Right at the bottom of the flower, you're in the oval area. That's where the nectar is. So the bee's got to go past the filaments or the, an the anther, picking up some of the pollen down to get the nectar, and then flies back out again. When it gets to the next flower, it does the same thing, and some of that pollen falls into the stigma, which then fertilizes the plant. But look at the structure of the plant. If you have a very deep flower, bees with short tongues can't get there. That's when you get the hummingbirds or the long tongue bees. It's very shallow, you get a multiple of bees coming in. So one of the questions that should be going past your mind then, don't bees cause cross-pollination of different plant species? The answer is no, they don't, because when the bees go out to collect food, they decide on what, what species of plant they're going to visit. And they'll only visit that particular species. So they don't, do not cause cross-pollination. Plants will sometimes, or flowers will sometimes have nectar guides. So as the nectar develops in the flower, it will change color in the center of the flower. And the bees see this, and they'll realize that the nectar there is ripe for them to go in there. There are a couple of bees that have become smart to this idea of the tubular flower, and they can't get into it. So they go to the base and bite a hole in the bottom to get to the nectar. Unfortunately, that's no value to the plant because it doesn't pollinate the plant. So what affects the bees is the color, the shape, the fragrance, uh, the habit of the plant, and whether it has both nectar and pollen in it. So when you plant, you want to plant a variety of plants if you want a variety of native bees to be in that area. We talked about pollen being important. So it says here 25% needs to be protein. Nectar is the carbohydrate, the oils and resins for desert type plants. Nectar guides are the colors or stripes that the bees see in the plant. The shape and the, and the color contrast uh, determines which type of bee is there. So bees generally are not good flyers. Uh, they have difficulty landing. So having a landing spot and then walking to the flower is important for some of the bees. A nice manicured area like this only supports a few few animals or creatures. Start putting some trees and bushes in there, it's even better. Having a stream there is even better. Where we want to get to with our natural parks is the top picture. So this is the picture I was thinking of. So when I'm asked to evaluate a garden or an area or a park, 
what do I look for? I'm not looking for box bushes like we see on the top right hand corner where every leaf is perfect. It's perfect because it has no food value for the insects and other native creatures in that area. I'd much rather like the bottom right hand one. It's actually a Turk's cap, got holes all over the place. I know it's been visited and see some similar circular holes on the edge. So leaf cut has been in there. On the right hand side is a, a particular grass called a thunder grass, which is our, uh, a mix of three local um, grass types. The bees like that because you can put uh, two inch flowers in there and it looks very good and it grows both in the sun as well as semi shade area. So our bees don't all fly the same distance. Our native bees, there's some of the very sh short distance. Uh, they talk about here, these distances are not quite what I've experienced in life, but it's a good enough picture, so I've used it anyway. Some of our bees only have a distance of about 50 feet away from their nests. Others can go further. The important aspect is just try and connect your different gardens so bees can go from one garden to another. So you are looking for pathways for the bees as well as the butterflies to thrive and provide more food for them. Trees are better for, the, for bees than wildflowers simply because one tree is equivalent to about an acre of flowers. So when you think of that a, a bottle of honey, uh, for every ounce of honey in there, there's a million flowers that have been visited to get nectar. We need a lot of flowers. So bushes, trees are great to be put in that area. Bees do uh, navigate through three-dimensional maps, so it helps them to define where they should be going and where the plant is. When you plant, you want to plant in clumps. Going to one plant and picking up the nectar from that flower is uneconomic for the bee. They consume more energy to do that than they get back from the nectar they'll get from that particular plant. So they will go to clumps of plants. So when you plant, plant them in clumps and plant them in a connected way so the bees can go from one to the other. Types to plant, well, native plants are the best. Uh, any of the herbs are good. All types of bees uh, and insects like herbs. So that's a good backup to plant herbs. Uh, in that area, and they most of them are um, drought resistant, and they come back year after year. There are mixes that are specifically made for bees. Happy Bee Mix is a good one. I've used that quite a lot. Uh, bee Bowl is another one. And then this year, I say the University of Illinois has come out with their own mix to put in the ground. And the, what's nice about these mixes is they provide flowering plants throughout the year, from the spring right through to fall. If you're planting specific types of plants, look at when they flower. So the bee lawn I talked about, it flowers from about May through to September. So the more important thing in the next two slides is the season in which you get flowers. If you're only planting one, for example, the one on the left, the beard tongue, it only flowers between May and July. But what happens the rest of the year? Some of our native bees will be hibernating, so it's not a problem. But those that don't hibernate, like a honeybee, is a problem for them. So you're also plant bee balm because that flowers from about July through to September. A lot of the, the flowers you get, the, at least a lot of the um, charts you get either from the pollinator partnership or from the native plant societies will give you and tell you which seasons they actually flower. Showing you size is important. So this is the Texas passion flower. You'll notice there's some honeybees on it, but look at the size of the honeybee. It's too small to be able to scrape against the pollen at the top, but they're getting the nectar at the bottom. So to pollinate the passion flower, we need something else. We need bumblebees. So there's a bumblebee. It's able to reach both the anther at the top to get the pollen and the nectar at the bottom. When it comes to dealing with weeds, uh, yeah, I keep on saying to me, what's a weed? What be, might be a weed to one person is not necessarily a weed to another. But in some municipalities, they've moved away from using Roundup, thank goodness, and other pesticides, and they're using steams. This is what they're doing here. They're using steam to kill off the weeds. This is a common habit in a lot of our vineyards to use steam rather than any uh, insecticide or a fungicide or um, weed chemical because the grapevines absorb it. We want to stay away from pests. It's amazing how, how he's um, using insecticides as well as we decides. Bee lawn, I mentioned the thundergrass. He has two others that are really good, principally because they have a mixture of different plants in them that will grow throughout the year. Buzz pollination is something that's particularly done by bumblebees. Certain of our plants, like our tomato plants, require buzz pollination for fertilization. What happens is the bee lands on the plant and then it shakes its flight muscles. 
and it causes the plant to vibrate. And as a result, you get this cloud of pollen that leaves the plant to go and do the pollination. Uh, the frequency that's used is, anybody got a guess? Think about it. It's middle C. Useless information, but I thought it was interesting. What products do we get from the hive? Well, we get honey, which we know about. A lot of medicinal properties for honey, uh, for wound care, uh, gangrene care, throat issues for general health, uh, wax. Propolis is another product that we get from honey, which is really good for antibacterial, antimicrobial. Bee venom uh, has a protein in it that fights cancerous tumors. Bee bread is a good food source, but in two sort of supplies, I don't do anything about it. And then pollen. The bees actually ferment the pollen because they can't consume the pollen because the cuticle on it, neither can we. But they produce uh, something called bee bread, which is uh, fermented pollen. The product or the compound that's in honey that really provides us with a medicinal uh, effect is the methoglycoxylate. They also produced um, peroxide. Peroxide is when water gets into the honey, and this is really effective in wounds. So putting honey in wounds dries the wound out because it absorbs the moisture that's in there. It forms peroxide, which then kills off bacteria that are in the wound. If you heat honey to above 60 degrees centigrade, which is about 100 120, I think it is, Fahrenheit, it kills all the medicinal properties of honey. So a lot of the commercial honeys that you buy in stores are pasteurized because the lawyers tell us we have to pasteurize it, but that means it kills it. All you're buying is colored sugar water. Filtering out the pollen to keep, to have a nice clear honey, takes out all the pollen. The pollen initiates crystallization. It also desensitizes the body for, for allergies. So if you get honey that you look through and it's nice and crystal clear in there, it is near use to you. And if you are buying honey for allergies, make sure you're getting honey from that particular season of which you have the allergy. It's no use buying honey that's reaped in fall when you've got a spring allergy. The main thing in honey that uh, helps us medicinal factor is the ratio of glucose to fructose. The nice thing about using honey in wounds for wound care is unlike our human created medicines we put in there which heal from the outside in honey heals from the inside out not only does it dry out the wound kills off the bacteria and viruses in there but causes an osmotic uh, action to suck out from the lymph fluids into the wound to create um, growth so we, this one actually talks about manuka honey manuka honey is honey essentially from new zealand honey itself is very good but the bees get nectar from the manuka bush, which is part of the tea tree family, which is also really good for use for wounds. But combining the two, you get a super honey. But let me tell you, in the UK, they purchase more manuka honey than New Zealand uh, produces. So the question becomes, uh, well, what else is everybody else is buying? Is it really manuka? Honey itself kills all our known uh, viruses at the moment, including the four major ones that are in the hospitals, the super bugs. They kill them off. And the reason why they're very effective at this is that they don't actually attack the virus directly. They indirectly attack it, which means the virus can't build up an immunity to it. The royal jelly, which is created by the bees, has not only an antioxidant, uh, anti-tumor property, also anti-aging property, anti-inflammatory property was great, but there's not a lot that's created by the bees, very small quantities. So I don't tend to push this much at all. Other treatments, there are a lot of treatments that are out there for honey. Honey in warm water relieves constipation. Honey in cold water causes constipation. But as you see, mixed with some herbs, people have used them for all sorts of things. The very interesting application at the moment is developed by a company here in San Antonio. We have a lot of problems with elderly patients where the skin becomes very brittle. They get sores bed sores, for example, they will not heal. In fact, this get worse and worse, and it becomes a major problem for the elderly. Well, by using honey, they found that the honey can actually reverse this and heal because honey has the both the property of regenerating in that area, causing regeneration in that area, but as well as uh, killing off what's ever in the wound. So this company has developed a film that you can put on top there so you know, it means you don't have to touch it we don't have to press or rub just lay this gauze on top of the wound it dissolves over a period of time so you don't pull it off and do further damage 
The approach of the healing is both by reducing the bacterial inflammation in the wound, but at the same time causing growth factors to take place. And as I mentioned earlier in that earlier slide, it sucks the juices or the uh, solutions out of the lymphatic nodes and from the sub uh, skin layers to cause that growth. Its impact has been to reduce the various uh, gram, both gram positive and gram negative bacteria by 99% within 24 hours. So it's a really exciting development that we're watching what's going to happen in the future with it. Nice picture of a bee just taking a rest. So bees do sleep. They do sleep on their trips. Most of the bees will sleep in a companion except for solitary bees like this particular one, which is on a cactus. Here's a leaf cutter bee going into a reed. My tickle bee, which I enjoy. Unfortunately, we've basically killed them out. Um, some bees that are snoozing on the way. Um, cellophane bees are actually brewmasters. They've been able to use bacteria to brew their food, which they use for um, their young. Same sort of bacteria that they use in fermenting yogurts and sauerkrauts. The bumblebees, to address the fact that the flowers are not flowering when they come out, have developed a way to encourage the, the plant to actually flower earlier than it does by nibbling on the plant. They don't actually destroy the plant, they nibble on it to encourage early flowers to develop in the plants. Bee life has now reduced by almost 50% over the last 50 years. They don't live nearly as long as they used to. And it's been made worse by the beekeepers who are using artificial ways to increase the number of hives and also to mate with the queens. Resilience of colonies are a problem, particularly with uh, the different chemicals we use in there. The other problem we're having with colonies is people are inspecting colonies more often than they should do. So bees create an atmosphere using their propolis to help to keep down the bacteria in the colony. And every time you open it up, of course, this exposes it to the air. The, the atmosphere dissipates and takes the bees about a week to replace it, which is why a lot of our managed bees are dying off because we inspect too often. The World Health Organization has suggested, as well as the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, is look back to tropical Africa. Uh, their bees are lasting longer. They're resistant. Try and imitate what they're doing down there for the hives. That's just um, a leaf cutter bee bringing back pollen, the bee going into the ground. That's a pretty picture, which I took, so I thought I had to share it. Uh, there's a bumblebee fishing out something. You see all the pollen stuck to its hair. So what do you want to do? Try and join this movement that Doug telling me started. It was creating your national park in your own yard. Uh, he's got a book out on this, which I really enjoyed reading. It encouraged you to grow uh, native plants in the area for the benefit of not only our looks, but also of the insects and other creatures in that environment. So where were all the flowers gone? Those of you who are around in the 1960s remember the song about this. So it's not a new phenomenon. And create an environment that's bee friendly. So I hope you enjoyed that and I'm open to any questions. We do have a few questions. Somebody asked, when do they build their nests? And I assume they mean the ground bees? They start building them soon after the flower has pollinated because they need energy for that. So towards the uh, middle of spring, they will start building them. Most of the nests will be built by the end of spring. The carpenter bees, the large carpenter bees don't actually make holes in your wood. They will, they will find a hole already made by somebody else and enlarge it and go in there. So if you want to prevent the large carpenter bees in your wood structures, make sure they're painted with something or lacquered or so, or then they won't go in. There's one over here I see about what is the impact of Roundup? Yeah. Uh, how does Roundup impact bees? Roundup is a, a neurological uh, chemical that affects your um, nervous system. And so what happens is uh, bees have basically three brain centers in their body, one in the abdomen that controls abdomen functions, one in the thorax that controls the flight and, and legs, and then one in the head that controls all the senses. And what it does, it prevents them from communicating with each other. So everything comes disorganized, out of sync. It also affects their ability to determine where they are and find, because it stops the eyes from being able to see the three-dimensional environment and where they are. So they become disorientated. So they don't fly back to their hive. They go in other different directions. And then um, 
the nervous system breaks down. And then when a bee that's been affected by it starts to die, it goes into spasms and it goes to die through all the spasms. So it's really a nasty chemical. You suggested to have a log in your garden. Would it be helpful to drill holes in the log? Would that help them? And if so, how large? So the log, the softer the wood for the log, the better. And uh, anything from four inches diameter and upwards is good. Drilling holes in it will help the um, leaf cutter bee, will help the large mason bee as well. It will encourage other bees to start looking at that area. So yes, it will help. You want holes that are either eight millimeter or 12 millimeter in diameter, no larger than 12, but you also want some small ones, six to eight millimeter as well. Is there a minimum amount of plants per clump we should be aiming for? This person plants in groups of three to five. Is that too little? Three is definitely too, well, you know, if it's like a, a big bush of flowers, like the daisy bushes or the lantanas, then you know, one or two bushes is ample. Everything else, if it's, you know, only has a half a dozen flowers on it, then you want at least five to 10, I would say 10 to 12 fl uh, flowers together to form a clump. What is the safest time to mow during the year? Never. Never. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, you know, it depends on how deep you mow. We have a lot of native plants that, that will flower and they're only about two inches tall. And so if you, if you mow at the three inch depth, then that's great. Just bear in mind that in your lawn, there are bees that are flying around or walking around in, in the lawn. So when you put a lawnmower through that, you tend to kill them. That's just not a good idea. Um, I use some I use native plant seed, grass seed, and then I ask the seed supplier to put in the two-inch flowers in there, and that's that's great. Uh, mowing in spring is definitely not a good idea because a lot of our so-called weeds like dandelions and things like that. Um, they provide the first food for bees will be killed off because they won't have a chance to flower and they won't have a chance to seed. So if you really have to uh, mow, then try and mow summer, fall, um, if you really have to. Okay. Can you comment on the use of bee hotels? So the concepts of bee hotels are great, but for our native bees, the, for the 15 to 20% that actually live in holes above the ground, but bear in mind, more than 70% of them live in the ground. A lot of the commercial bee hotels that I see available from the big departmental stores, the holes are too big and they won't go in there. Um, so you want ones that have small holes. Uh, I take reeds or bamboo that's small that are less than 12 millimeter in diameter. A lot of them are around six to eight. So six to eight is my favorite size. Uh, cut a whole lot of them that are about uh, six to 10 inches long. Make sure one end of it is sealed off by the natural uh, seal in the bamboo or the reed. Clump them together, tie them together, and then put them in a shady spot facing down with the entrance facing down so water doesn't get in. Um, and that works very well. But you can create some very nice hotels to using different media. You can put sort of grass in there. You can put pine cones in there. That'll help out. Well, you know, we had a little burst of every Girl Scout troop and uh, kindergarten making bee hotels, but they tended to be never facing down and much bigger holes. So I can see that that may not have been the right answer. But I have heard that if you have too many hotels in the same area, that if there's some disease or infection that you just wipe them all out and that you should have very small hotels. What do you think? So the hesitation is, uh, theoretically, it sounds right. But if you think of solitary bees don't interact with each other, unless the disease is on the plant or on the flower and they visit the same flower, then there's a problem with that. Um, you know, how close is close? If you look at the, the, the bees that go into the, into the ground, uh, in the patch that I've got at home, probably every six to eight inches there's a hole. So they're very close together. Um, if you're going to use the bee hotels or the, the clumps of reeds, I would probably put them two or three feet apart, create some space. I'm more concerned about, the, you know, they don't have a large range for their food and you're putting more of them together reduces the amount of food that each of them can go and get. So I'm more concerned about that than disease. And a lot of them are, are pretty tolerant to disease, particularly our small uh, bees. In, the only thing they're not tolerant of is moisture. So I want to talk about honey. When one goes to the grocery store to buy honey, it's all clear. 
clear honey. So what's the right question if you're going to buy honey from a local person to make sure that it hasn't been turned into sugar water? Do you say, do I want natural honey? Do I want what's right not pasteurized honey or what's how how do you how do you describe what i want to ask for raw honey raw unfiltered honey raw okay and then you pick it up and you look and if it's all cloudy that's good because it's got pollen in it so that'll help there um you don't want any but they don't really heat it's very difficult to where to tell them as a member of the public to where it's been heated or not but if you talk about raw honey, raw local honey, that's great. And when they when they say local and they say yes, then ask the question, well, where are your apiaries? Because in Texas, we can call honey Texas if it's got a label or one of the processes is done in Texas, it can be called Texas honey. There is the Texas beekeepers have started bringing out a label which uh, it's guarantees it's local. Unfortunately, becoming a member and then paying $200, you can buy the label. There's no check of whether it is actually local or not. So that's difficult. So if you ask them, where's your apiary? And if the apiary is nearby or in the area, they're then pretty sure it's going to be good for you. Okay. Just go back to that question about the holes. I misheard the holes. As I see in the comments, talk about how close can the holes be together? Um, they can be within half an inch of each other. That's not a problem. And then predators are going to be either wasps or birds. So for the birds, I put a bit of gauze on the front so the bird can't get into it and have a gap of at least two or three inches between the gauze and the uh, hole. Um, wasps generally are not a big problem. Yes, they do go after bees, they do eat bees, but not a lot of the time. So I wouldn't worry too much about them. Bev, could I ask a question? This is Wendy. Sure. Question about the large carpenter bees that we have at work. They are basically turning our seeding structure into sawdust. I'm wondering how can I friendly ask them to leave or remove them? Ah, well, prevention is better than cure. So the thing is, any hole that's three eighths of an inch in size has, is a potential for a carbon to be to go in. So the idea is go and close those holes up and then paint the surface or put a lacquer on it or something like that so that then they won't go in there. If they are there already, the best way to get rid of them out is um, what I tend to use is almond oil. And I put that into a bit of spray and just one pump of spray there keeps them away. Almond oil? Yes. Almond essential almond oil. Oh, just like the spice. Uh, not, the, not the spice. If you, if you get the essential oils, they come in the one ounce or two ounce bottles and they cost about six or eight dollars each or something like that. I get that and I put that into a small uh, spray, pump spray, and just spray that next to the hole and they will stay away. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. We have at least 122 people listening tonight, and that's a pretty good crowd, don't you think? It's great. <laughs> thank you, Mark. I love learning about bees, so thank you so much.